We now turn to the broadband section of the convocation. Please welcome to the stage Catherine Bates, Manager of State and Local Partnerships for the U.S. Department of Commerce's National Telecommunications and Information Association. It's not often that I go after a governor, so I'm just telling you guys that. So, good morning and hello. It's exciting to be in North Carolina this week, being from the state just to the west, who isn't known for their basketball prowess, to be honest. I'm just glad my volunteers don't have to meet a North Carolina team till the final four, but I do have them winning it all. So, go Vols. Any volunteers? There we go. I knew I'd have at least one or two. There we go. Um, but also, it's exciting to be in North Carolina this week because there's so much going on in broadband. You just saw the dig once policy for the state. That's huge. That's huge. There's not that many states out there that have passed that legislation. So the work that the state is doing on broadband and has been doing on broadband is tremendous. Um, I'd say I was talking out <clears throat> during the reception that, uh, not the reception, the breakfast, that North Carolina is probably in the top five states when I have to talk about states for broadband on what they're doing and what they've been doing. So keep up the good work, keep talking about the importance of it. Now I'm gonna introduce myself. I'm Catherine Bates, as you know. Um, I'm at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, and I always have to look, because I never know what it stands for. Um, NTIA at the Department of Commerce. NTIA's primary duty is to advise the White House on telecommunications policy. Um, right now, the a top priority for the Department of Commerce and the administration is expanding America's broadband connectivity. We all know that effort is critical to our nation's economy. So who here thinks, I just want to kind of get the lay of the land, who thinks that their communities have adequate broadband access? A couple. There's one over there. But you see the lack of hands? Um, it's what we hear as we go across the country talking about broadband. We host summits and workshops, provide technical assistance to communities, and, and keep talking about broadband. We need more broadband access, both in deployment and in use. Um, because of this, NTIA recently joined with our federal partners to announce the American Broadband Initiative a comprehensive effort to stimulate increased private sector investment in broadband. The initiative outlines with over 20 federal agencies, and I can't even tell you the acronyms for them all, are doing to streamline federal permitting, leveraging federal assets, and most importantly, maximizing the effectiveness of federal funding for broadband. I hope you'll join me later at the later session to hear more about this effort. In addition, NTIA has also begun work on a map to update nationwide broadband availability data. And, okay, so another question. Does anybody know about broadband mapping? Does the broadband mapping data that you have in your community really represent what's going on? A little bit. Oh, I was like, a little bit, I heard it. Okay, so we all know that's an issue. So we're partnering with eight states, including North Carolina in the initial um, section, as well as California, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Tennessee, Utah, and West Virginia to give policymakers at the state and federal level a deeper understanding of which parts of the con country lack broadband access. North Carolina was selected because of their continuing work on connecting the entire state. Um, data and mapping is key to understanding what areas should be targeted for federal funding of broadband, but it's a really complex issue. I had no idea how complex it was until I got in the weeds on it. Today, we're very fortunate to have a keynote speaker who understands the intricacies of broadband funding and access in Mignon Clyburn. Mignon Clyburn served as commissioner on the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, from 2009 to 2018 and she was acting chair from May to November of 2013. During her nearly nine years at the FCC, Commissioner Clyburn was committed to closing the pers persistent digital divide that continues to challenge rural, native, and low wealth communities, the ones that you represent. Specifically, she pushed for the modernization of the agency's lifeline program, which assists low income consumers in defraying the cost of voice and broadband service. 
championed diversity in media ownership, initiated inmate calling services reforms, emphasized diversity and inclusion in STEM opportunities, and for, fought to preserve a free and open internet. I personally experienced her commitment to closing the digital, digital divide with her work on E-rate modernization for schools and libraries, an extremely important process that helped connect libraries. Um, she's a true hero to champion the underserved. Before coming to the FCC, Clyburn served 11 years on the South Carolina Public Service Commission. Prior to that, she was the publisher and general manager of the Coastal Times, a family-founded Charleston weekly-based newspaper focusing on issues affecting the African-American community. She is currently a fellow at the Open Society Foundation, where she continues to champion efforts to eliminate predatory rates for prison telephone services, and is also a princ the principal of MLC Strategies. She's a graduate of the University of South Carolina and holds a BS in banking, finance, and economics. It's an honor to introduce Mignon Clyburn, and please join me in welcoming her. Good morning, everyone. Okay, wait a minute. Oh, we're going to try that again, because I know I didn't travel all the way from Washington, D.C. to get a Washington, D.C. good morning. So we're going to try that one more time. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. There you go. I'm home, or near home. <laughs> Allow me to thank us, thank Ms. Bates uh, for such a warm and generous introduction, uh, Mr. Woody for extending such a generous invitation to this South Carolinian, and for all of you for not only taking part in today's advocacy event, and tomorrow I hear too, but for the years you have spent tackling the challenges of yesterday and mustering even more energy and passion to uplift your communities and address the challenges that remain. As I look into this audience of over 600 strong, I cannot help but marvel over how different things look this morning than they did one morning almost 10 years ago. I was largely responsible for a broadband hearing and workshop in my hometown of Charleston that October, where nearly 200 people were packed into the classroom at our technical college's downtown campus. Now, I wish I could brag this morning and say that most of those people were here to listen to me and to talk about the power of broadband and our collective desire to connect communities, but no. Most of them were there because they were mad. They were extremely emotional that morning because they were upset about what a certain FCC employee had said and wanted him fired. And they made it very clear. And, 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 and then a, a, a burgeoning uh, social media uh, a presence uh, to, uh, to let them know that they were there to disrupt our event. So security was tight. Things were a little scary. So we elected to only accept written questions. You know that's, a, that's how we do things, right? Weeding out the threats, because there were death threats, and better managing that exchange. Now, well, I will say it reset most of the narrative vibe in the room. It really angered those who figured out what we were up to. And when it became clear that we were going to stick to our focus of connecting communities, which is what we advertise, most of those who wanted to be disruptive, they left. And an incredible discussion took place from those representing various communities, particularly those communities who so rarely get a seat at the table. But as tense as things were that October, Two things remain to, with me to this day, and they drive just about everything I do, and I suspect you too. One, the importance of diverse interests and perspectives should always be seated around the table. I don't want to add that later that night, we would head over to the metropolis of Hollywood, South Carolina, to ensure a focus on rural need, but not before the second and not as friendly exchange took place. There was a gentleman 
who is very forward and direct, as we say back home, in my face, who represented half of that audience and was angry not only for not having his questions addressed, but he wanted to make this point that not one dollar that he pays in federal taxes should ever go towards paying for the internet so that some kid could play video games all day long on his dime. Now that was in the fall of 2009, and the issue of broadband was actually a divider, not a unifier. The challenge was not only relevance by those who were disconnected or not connected to the internet, but by those who had broadband, but did not see why it was important for everyone else to be connected. Too many back then viewed broadband as a luxury, not as a necessity. They were represented by the, that day by those who made it clear that their universal service dollars should not go to fund an internet connection. And while I know government should always reflect the will of the people, I am proud to say to you, and was proud back then, that we did not listen to that gentleman. The Federal Communications Commission put forth additional reforms, not fewer, that included explicit support for broadband-enabled networks and gambled during that time that those who had no desire to substitute affordability initiatives for the millions, the tens of millions of Americans who needed help to establish and maintain a broadband connection, that those on that day who did not see why they should care about resources that failed to flow to primarily rural communities that would benefit the most, if we are honest, from being connected. That schools and libraries unable to provide 21st century opportunities for students and lifelong learners would have more options, not less and that looking to expand telehealth and telemedicine opportunities to those without access within miles of where they live could soon be a reality, and that aging parent or grandparent or uncle or aunt without transportation at the click of the mouse could have the power of improved health at their fingertips. What we did that day forward and what we continue to do at the FCC and with all of you is we are day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, putting down a series of down payments because that's what responsible and compassionate partners do that want to enable communities to be the best that they can be. A responsible partner gives you support and cover when others say, those people don't need broadband at home. They can go to the library because we know that for too many, there is no library anywhere nearby, that there are transportation issues getting to the library, that there is a long, sometimes hour long wait getting a terminal, or that the hours those libraries are open are simply not convenient for those juggling two jobs and a family. So as I look around this room and see that the name of this segment focuses on the issues that unite, and what unites is the issue of broadband, I smile and say, in less than 10 years, look how far we have come. There are only a few that would argue, or at least out loud, that broadband access is one of the greatest equalizers of our time. That is one of those great disruptors that not only rapidly changes industries, communities, and people, but enables them. That technology and connectivity improves our bottom lines enhances our outcomes, create efficiencies, and yes, 
bridges divide. It completely changes when, how, and where medical care takes place. It is leveling the playing field for that entrepreneur who cannot afford a storefront, putting them on par with a brick and mortar competitor. It has enabled that farmer, and I know you know who he is because I saw he won an award in Monroe, and has helped him to become a top agricultural producer. It is breaking down barriers that once stood in the way of those students in Cumberland wanting to learn calculus, but not having a teacher on their campus. And it remains and hopefully increasingly is becoming a beacon of hope for those HBCUs in this state that are educating first generation college students and better contributors to our society. I recognized long ago, like the natural trails and waterways relied upon by our ancestors, that the paths of these networks sprout commerce, innovation, knowledge, and opportunity, or at least the promise of these. Where we used to rely on the forces of nature to decide which communities would be blessed with riches, we now have the power to control and leverage, leverage where networks flow and who and what communities they serve. Through technological advances and ingenuity, we can overcome long-standing problems of geography or topography and ensure that these networks are navigable and open to all. We can direct these networks to the most far-flung corners of this state through physical conduit in the ground, radio waves, or even distant signals from space. The reach of these networks and what they are capable of today is only limited by our collective will and the resources we are willing to allocate. But just how do we make sure that people's most basic needs are met by the very networks designed to connect us? How can we deliver equitable access to the information and services these communities need the most? We do that together by leveraging every single combination of public-private, public-public, or public, whatever combination of three Ps, six Ps, nine Ps of partnerships that we know today and are poised to create tomorrow. Why? Because our communication system, it is very special. The precious resource these networks carry it's sometimes difficult to describe, yet it's extremely personal. In an instant, these networks put our voices in someone's ear, our face before someone's eyes, transmits our thoughts or ideas to one person or many, bring us to school, to the doctor, to the bank. They deliver our goods, provide our services, bring us help in case of emergency, connect us to news, enable our leisure, and immediately give us a presence in just about every or any community in the world. For better or for worse, communication services seem less like a tool and more like a, an extension of ourselves, connecting us to what society has become and what we are becoming. But the communication sector does not just intersect with every other critical sector in our economy, society, and democracy. It is inextricably intertwined. Healthcare, education, energy, agriculture, commerce, governance, civic engagement, labor, housing, transportation, public safety, all rely on this modern communications infrastructure, if indeed it's to reach us all any weaknesses or shortcomings, systemic or isolated, will have ripple effects that can be difficult to discern, but are unmistakable in their impact. These dynamics existed, believe it or not, to a lesser extent, back in 1934, 
when Congress set out to centralize regulatory authority over the nation's communications infrastructure in a new federal agency called the Federal Communications Commission. Even back then, Congress recognized the vital need for this new regulatory body. The agency was created with a very specific and deceptively simple task to make available so far as possible to all the people of the United States a rapid, efficient, nationwide and worldwide radio communication service with adequate facilities, get this, at reasonable charges. So it's important to set that narrative today and understand the importance of proper communications policy and reinforce that is in a combined effort, federal, state, and local efforts, if it's truly going to work and be inclusive for all. Now, some people might think that the FCC is a highly technical, and it is, agency that falls outside of public consciousness, and I get unconscious sometimes when I think about it. But it is a doorway, my friends, to larger battles that are taking place in this country. The battle of the unconnected. The universal service programs that the FCC administers, along with monies from the Department of Agriculture, over the past five years, get this, allocated $22 billion to connect rural America. Yet one third of rural citizens, and I believe that number is approaching 45% in rural North Carolina. If they're lucky, they have dial-up. If not, they have nothing. So we spent tens of billions of dollars over the past uh, several years, yet we still have lots to do to fulfill our promise of serving this entire nation Lawmakers have a role in fulfilling that promise. And I know, while I cannot tell you or I cannot uh, lobby you, I know you will make it clear what their role is. And part of your role is to do just that, because the communities and the people you serve back home, they can't do it by themselves. These programs and these initiatives are much more than wires and towers or plans or devices. They represent a commitment we made long ago to ensure that no community is left behind or cut out, cut off from our economy and society. We're attempting to confront debilitating inequities by inviting more of us, not less, onto that playing field. These programs can and seek to improve health and educational outcomes, reduce the opportunity gaps that exist between the have and have nots. Through these programs, it is possible to leapfrog the status quo and bring the next generation of tools and resources to communities that, honestly, are still waiting for the last generation to arrive. A program supporting high cost and hard to reach areas attempts to ensure that advanced networks reach every single county by subsidizing build out. The same way we did with our postal infrastructure, our electrical grid through Russ, the railroads, and yes, remember plain old telephone service? The values remain the same. So as I take my seat, because I got my two minute warning, I will say to you that you have affirmed with your presence, your commitment to removing barriers. But that will only happen quickly if we disregard labels, if we put aside our political difference, if we look beyond past conflicts, because if we could do it alone, it would have been done. But let me tell you how it would have been done. It would have been done 
through your eyes, not through the eyes of many. So the challenge you have today in an interconnected world with time and distance, honestly, they no longer limit us. Your collective strength is your greatest strength, regardless of where you call home. So today, I, along with you, will reaffirm my commitment to set for others and ourselves a roadmap to prosperity. And prosperity will only come in an expedited way if our communities are connected and that that connectivity is affordable and accessible to all. Thank you very much. Now it's the Oprah time. Yes. Can everybody hear me? Not yet. I have a loud voice, but um, you make my heart sing. Um, someone asked a question. I want to do a little bit of a deeper dive okay. into what you ended with and how do we, how, imp I know you think it's very important to address the affordability of broadband yes. in low and moderate income communities as well as rural communities because the build out to those communities is expensive. So how do you suggest that the issue of affordability is addressed in these cases? We have to look at connectivity um, like we look at a coin, which has two sides. So when it comes to infrastructure build, those public-private partnerships, going outside of the norms, you know, uh, dealing with you know, co-ops and businesses and hospitals, and I saw it in one county with um, the Department of Transportation, creating those different types of partnerships that could economically smooth out and leverage uh, the cost of, uh, of providing service. Going outside of the usual norms and getting rid of the silos that, to be honest with you, if I could you know, kind of self-critique where I uh, was for almost nine years, um, the universal service program, as great as it is, the silos oftentimes make it less efficient um, for us to really leverage um, you know, that, uh, you know, those economic dollars to deliver services quickly uh, and more affordably. But we can't it, ignore the other side of the coin, which deals with affordability. These numbers are grossly understated. We might talk about the map I heard you mention in the map, which I, I, I'm, I'm just gonna be plain spoken. I've got a problem with the map. You should have a problem with the map, map because there's a problem with the map. Um, <laughs> that's just how me. Let's, 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 let's just put it out there. Because honestly, if one census tract, one, I live in a census tract that nobody else has service. I have service somehow. I can afford $300 a month, which I can't. But let's just say for the record, I could. And I had Oprah's money and could do that then that whole census tract is, is, is seen as counted. And the FCC and others thinks the job is done. That distorts the picture and distorts the need. So on the affordability side of the, 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 that coin, you've got to recognize that there are people that their paychecks don't last the entire week. But connectivity is more important to them. They need to be able to dial 911. You know, they need to be able to uh, uh, find that job and opportunities. They, they need connectivity. So if they can't afford, honestly, selfishly, it's in our best interest to provide the means for them to be afforded because, you know, to have affordability, because honestly, they will be less of an economic um, burden. They're not burdens, but their situation um, could cause an economic you know, burden on society. It is in our best interest to see that every single person who cannot afford a connection has a connection. It will labor uh, 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 more uh, self-dependent, you know, you will be more self-reliant, less dependent, um, and we all save money and time when that happens. That's just 
playing good math and good business, and we need to honestly stop demonizing the Lifeline program and expand it to voice and broadband, make it easier and not harder. Forget all of whoever phone it is. It's our phone enabling those who do not have to have. And if we can get away from the labels and the politics, we can connect America by 2022 and not by the time that I'm planted in, in 2042 or 62 or, or whatever too, that I'm not gonna remember if I live that long because all of this will be gone. <laughs> and and we, we can't afford to wait. Thank you. Thank you. I know, long answer. Affordability yeah. is a big issue. Is. And as we go out and talk at NTIA, I know people come up with, yes, we have service, but it's too expensive. Right. So, I'm going to ask a question. I'll try to be brief. I'm sorry. I'm a no, PK, a no. politician's kid. So you know brief answers are just not in our DNA. No, so and, I apologize. And this question I get everywhere I go. Okay. How do we ensure more bro accurate mm. broadband mapping in this country? Mm -hmm. you, you stated the problem. Yeah. Do you have a solution? So one of the things that I made sure, and I got some pushback on this, was to institute a less burdensome challenge test. Um, uh, you know, so if, if you know that the map is wrong, you should be able to challenge that and show that and have the testing in place that's not overly burdensome and, and that you don't have to go through a lot of hoops. Uh, there is no map or, or you know, anything that is perfect, um, but there are ways for us to, to be more perfect. And the first thing to be more perfect is not to say a, uh, an area is served if there is only one person with service in a census I track, or if I as a company say that I can provide service, even if I don't provide service, guess what, little known ugly fact, that is counted as um, served also if the company has the ability, even if it doesn't have the desire or, uh, you know, uh, or, the, um, uh, or the plans to ever serve. We need to be more honest with our approach so that um, I don't know if that would be the numerator or denominator, but that number needs to be more reflective of what's on the, what's, what's, what you see on the ground. And the issue with broadband mapping is the funding is all tied to right. whether you're covered or not. So if, right. you're, if the map says you're covered, you can't get funding either from the FCC right. or USDA, which I, I, I don't know if anybody from USDA is here, but they have a new program also that relies heavily on uh, mapping. Right. And if, you, if you're covered and your companies are saying that you're covered, then they can't get any more money for right. that area. Right, so it's really important for you to yes. um, honestly uh, be an advocate, though I can't ask you to be an advocate, <laughs> um, um, but you know, uh, uh, to be a voice um, uh, uh, for accurate mapping. And North Carolina is working on this issue. So this afternoon, we'll talk about this issue more. But this community is also concerned that too much funding is going to deploy rural broadband at 10-1 mm. minimum speeds. And anybody who knows broadband, 10-1 is not going to get you anywhere these days. Um, do you support the minimum speed standard for the allocation of public funds to rural broadband being at the minimum of 25-3, which is what the FCC states is broadband? So I have heard the... Uh uh, the, the challenge or the pushback from some uh, providers about how expensive it is. But again, it is a long-term investment. Um, I think the m most uh, painful and for me, economically wasteful thing we could do is to have that minimum number of 10-1. I know um, I'm gonna have to tiptoe and put my uh, cavalier, or whatever it's called, you know, uh, um, you know, on with some of the providers. Um, to me, you're, you're wasting not only our time and money, but you're wasting um, and, and, and ensuring that the opportunities of within the next year are not going to be realized by the people um, you serve, you know, we, we serve. Uh, and so uh, again, we just need to, um, uh, I, I know cost is a factor. Cost is always a factor. And that is why we need to be more creative in the partnerships and new technologies and, I, you know, not, uh, you know, wireless internet service providers, satellite providers, legacy providers, everyone needs to have a seat at the table and really invest in new technologies that will help to make this um, uh, more within reach. The desire is always fiber. The desire is, you know, I mean, you, you want fiber to the premise. Um, uh, you know, how, what can we do to leverage that and do some in the meantime things to get there? 
and I'm only supposed to do three questions, but this leads um, to a last question that I'm gonna wrap up with. So how do we make it financially feasible for profit-driven companies to lay that last mile or to use a different technology besides fiber? So here is something I don't think will be controversial, but I'm gonna answer that in a different way. And I think I heard somebody else say, I don't know if it was a governor or lieutenant governor. Our equations are all wrong. And what I mean by that, we look at what it costs but not what the benefits, um, you know, what that will be derived. We look at what we have to write a check for today and not the avoided costs, um, you know, tomorrow. So if I am a, a, a grandma, give me the most rural county in, in, in the state. Holler it out. What was that? Graham. Yeah, that. <laughs> was that. Was that Graham? Say I, uh, I, I am me, um, a high presenting diabetic, luck, N not yet. I mean, I say that because they're, they're family history. I'm not mobile, and and, and I need you know uh, connectivity. Oh, what's I mean, I, honestly what? I, let me do better by giving a quick example. I'm sorry. I'm going over. <laughs> There's a pilot in uh, Mississippi that most of you know about a, a telehealth uh, uh, a pilot. Um, that um, started out with one or 200 uh, high-presenting diabetics, provided them with a laptop connectivity um, and day-to-day and, and -day monitoring. That little pilot saved 10,000 road miles, avoided miles, um, you know, covered. Um, it it, it uh, saved $330,000 to the state Medicaid uh, 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 program. Um, and the, there was one woman in that pilot that the year before went to the hospital six times, guess how many times she went after the year one of that project? Zero. Think about what was not spent with that connectivity, with the availability, with it being affordable. We're looking at it wrong, we're being too narrow. We need to look at the entire equation, which includes what will we avoid spending if we make this investment. And if we do that, then every medical, um, you know, you know, from uh, those in medicine, you know, those in law enforcement, those all along the delivery uh, plane will show that this is a fantastic investment that will pay dividends and we will see or be able to realize costs that we're paying today and we won't have to pay them tomorrow. The equation needs to be different and that needs to start now. So, yes. <laughs> this is a... Those are good talking points in case anybody was writing those down. So I would love to thank you, thank you for this. I could sit here all day and talk to her and ask her questions. She is a font of knowledge. And like I said, she is a true champion for the unserved and the underserved in our country. So I'd like to thank you thank again. You. Thank you, North Carolina. So that was fantastic and exactly what we hope to accomplish with this session. So let's give Mignon and Catherine another round of applause. So broadband really is the rural infrastructure economic development imperative of our time. And we really cannot rest until all of our stu students are able to do their homework, all of our senior citizens are able to be connected to health resources in a meaningful way, and all of our businesses are able to connect to the world, regardless of where they are located. Uh, it's so much more than uh, Netflix. It is essential infrastructure in the 21st century. And if you'd like to learn a lot more and dig a little deeper into broadband issues, we hope you'll join us for the broadband workshop this afternoon. Catherine will be presenting there and will be joined by state and local leaders uh, to get in the weeds and talk about access, affordability, and adoption rates. For now, though, we're going to take a short break, and we're going to shorten what was already a short break to stay on schedule and to help keep Governor Kasich on schedule. So I ask that uh, you take about a five-minute break, and we'll get started back here in a few minutes. Thank you.